any. Uh, well, tonight the sermon is from Galatians chapter 5, and uh, verses 5 to 15. If you're a veteran Christian, it's familiar territory to you. Um, this is about uh, the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Galatia, where he had been, he left, and then he heard about Judaizers, or people who came after him, saying that Jesus Christ is not enough to be saved from your sin. You need to obey, in particular, the Jewish laws of circumcision and other things. You need them both in. And the Apostle Paul heard about that, and he wrote back, and he said, who has deceived you? You only need faith in Jesus Christ. You don't need more than that. And so in the passage we're going to read talks about that. Now, that's the biblical context. And uh, especially freedom tonight is a theme, a biblical theme that I want to highlight. And in your children's Bible, in your pews, uh, there is a box on page 1,418, that's very personal. One is Christian freedom. And then 5 verse 13 uh, is referenced, Christians are not free to do whatever they want because God helps us. We are free to do what is right. Um, that's an important box. For me and my family, personally, we were born, I was born into a non-Christian home, non-churched, baptized when I was 12. I've given my testimony before. And uh, I was not the only one. I mean, the whole family. My dad was 50 years old when he was baptized. And mom was baptized. My younger sister, Penny, baptized too. And my older siblings, they were baptized later when they made their profession, public profession of faith. And I'd love to tell you that we all made it through. But for my older brother, Ray, he didn't make it through. There was the Vietnam War, and there were things in the church, and I didn't grow up. And uh, finally it came to the point where um, he self-resigned from the church. At that time, seen as uh, self-excommunication. And in part, and I have to be careful when I preach this about freedom, it was because of people like you. And when he became a new Christian teenager and trying to get involved with church things, and he did, he saw a lot of inconsistency on the part of people who claimed to be Christians. And that the things that he was doing before he was a Christian, they were doing after he was a Christian. What do you do when you're a teenager and you're told one thing, don't do these things, don't do these things as a Christian, they're in the world, and yet the people in the church do them, teens, adults. How do you handle that? Well, the obvious way is to do what many people do. Then you say, you're a bunch of hypocrites. That's all you are. People in the church are no different from me. That's one way to handle it. It's not the right way, but it's a start. I know within my family, I had a generation above me say about preachers. Preachers are just thieves, robbers. They want to get money out of your pocket into their pocket. Yeah. And that may be true sometimes. It's not supposed to be true. I'm coming back to the freedom that we have. Because we're hearing a lot, and that word a lot. It's election time. Freedom. Freedom to vote. Freedom to speak. Freedom to protest. Some people say freedom to burn American flags. Freedom. It's a word that's used often. 
And I want the sermon tonight to be an encouragement. I can remember talking with my brother after becoming a pastor, a minister, about spiritual things, about Jesus. And he's the one that we have to focus on when it comes to freedom. Because if we look at other people like me or you, we're going to fall short sometimes of using the freedom that we have to do what God wants us to do. And that's to serve and love him and others. And that's what Galatians 5 is about. I mean, Paul took what was going on in the church of Galatia very seriously. And when he heard about this other way of being saved from sin, there's only one way, and that's through faith in Jesus Christ. But we have work to do after that. But the work we do doesn't save us. So Galatians, chapter 5. I'll read from the pulpit, and then I'll come down. Hear God's holy word as it's read. <clears throat> Galatians, chapter 5, starting at verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and don't let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole match of dough. I'm confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. Thus far the reading from God's holy word. Thanks be to God. Well, in the sermon tonight, there are two things that I want to highlight. And we'll get there. One is there's a misunderstanding of salvation in this particular passage that Paul addresses. It's not Jesus and something else or someone else. It's just Jesus. When the Philippian jailer asked, Paul, what must I do to be saying? He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. We have to come back to basics always 
about salvation from sin. There is always going to be this challenge and this temptation to add to Jesus a little or a lot. And for the Christian, it's only by faith in Jesus that we are saved from sin. That's what the Bible says. That's what you taught me and my family. Not you personally, although some of you know my family. That's what you said. When we were in a little chapel, and we didn't know the Bible, oh, we'd heard, I'd heard about Jesus my whole life. He was a cursing name. Or God. I know what God did. God didn't save. He wouldn't damn people. It's not that I hadn't heard, or we hadn't. But we hadn't heard about Jesus saving us from our sins until you taught us, first through the ministry of a small chapel, supported by a Christian Reformed Church, and then coming to the big church, Franklin Street, the old Franklin Street Church, a block where we lived, and I had to go to catechism instead of Sunday school. And I didn't necessarily like it. I didn't know you. I knew the kids at Hillcrest Chapel. Uh, they were the ones that we were taught in Sunday school and Bible school. But here I am with a whole bunch of kids, many of them who had been Christians their whole lives, in catechism. Taught by the pastor, Elner, Ben Dikema, and also Pastor Harold Sonoma. And I learned more about Jesus. And one of the things that they and you taught me is about freedom. In the Heidelberg Catechism, the first question and answer, and the second question and answer. Again, you're a veteran Christian. You know this. Maybe you're a teacher yourself. Picking up on Galatians 5, that we are free from sin. This is what you taught me. What's your only comfort in life and in death? That I'm not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And then comes the next, or the rest, he has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me, and you know what the next word is? Set me free from, that's great, you know it. Has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head apart from or without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. And then the rest. And then in the second question and answer, what are the three things that you must know to live in God and die in the joy and discomfort? Three things. Something about my sin. How great my sin and misery are. And then the second thing. Again, freedom. How I am set, what? Free. From all my sin and misery. And third, how I am to thank God for such deliverance. Now, I point out to you what you already know. On the one hand, you are smart, informed people. I thank God for that. If it hadn't been for smart, informed Christians telling me and my family about Jesus, I, I wouldn't be here. And I thank the Lord for smart, educated, informed Christians. You have been blessed. If you have been born and raised in a Christian home, you are blessed from a child, and before you were born, you heard about Jesus. Now, I'm coming back to the main point about salvation. Salvation, 
must not be misunderstood. That it's Jesus and that saves us. It's Jesus. It's by God's grace that we have been saved through faith. This is not of our own doing. It's a gift of God, not of worth, lest anyone should boast. You taught me that verse. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. I can only say thank you to Christians at a church like the old Wyoming Park and now Faith Community for being concerned about people who are not Christians and telling them about Jesus. That Jesus is the way, the only way, the truth and the life. Now we have that in place. That's why as a preacher taught in seminary, it's at this point in the sermon that you make sure you call people to faith in Jesus Christ. If you're not a Christian, whether you're here in person or online, this is the time for you to know that God loves you. No matter where you lived, no matter how uneducated or educated in the Bible you may be, do you trust in Jesus as your Savior from sin? For those of you who answer that question with a yes, praise God. For those who are struggling, or maybe you said no, I need you to listen carefully. Because this church is a place that wants you to be around them so that you can hear about Jesus and you can see Jesus in them. Not a perfect life, but their goal is to use the freedom from sin that they have to point others to Jesus and how to live for him. Now, am I nervous when I say that about this church? Well, on the one hand, I could say, I don't know all of you. But I know that this is a church of Jesus Christ that proclaims the gospel of God's grace. And that you want to do what the words in front of you say. When I go to churches, I look for words around. Maybe it's banners. Maybe it's a communion table. Or maybe it's words that uh, talk about what this church is about. Celebrating grace, cultivating faith, reaching out, caring with love. Am I nervous when I preach in a sermon that at the end I am supposed to be, we are supposed to be able to say, Thus saith the Lord that this is a church that wants to do that and to be that, to celebrate God's grace, salvation in Jesus Christ first, and certainly to teach others to cultivate, to grow that faith in catechism, here in worship, preaching, Bible studies, in other ways. We start first with the foundation. Salvation, freedom from our sin in Jesus Christ alone. Do you understand that first? And then second, this passage of Scripture talks about why you and I have been set free from sin. Not to indulge the sinful nature. That's where the children's Bible comes in. Because that has to be highlighted not just to children, but to all Christians. That we use the freedom that we have. How? To love others. In this passage of Scripture, the Apostle Paul summarizes the law by saying, the whole law is summarized in this commandment. 
He doesn't even start with Lam God. He starts with Lam your neighbor as yourself. We are freed from our sins to serve by loving others. When we love others, we show how we're loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's what the Apostle Paul is talking about. Loving means caring. Loving means reaching out. And even though other people may not have grown up around us, or talk like us, or walk like us, when we encounter them at work, and certainly here in ministry, that we are to show the love of Jesus to them. Not compromising, not being hypocrites. I come back to that because that's a challenge I have and we all have. Admitting that we're not perfect, but striving to do what God wants. And that is to love our neighbor as ourselves. Starting in our homes, our marriages, our families, our workplaces, our schools, our social networks. After the sermon tonight, you and I have work to do to put into practice all that we believe by loving our neighbor, wanting their good, by reaching out and caring with love. The sermon is intended to encourage us, you and me. When we hear the word freedom, during this election year, we're going to hear it over and over and over again. And I know there's a freedom in a context of politics, and it has to be addressed. But the spiritual freedom we have in Christ has to be foundational and then to reach out. To care for others in all kinds of ways. And wanting others to be one over in Christ. I don't say that. You taught me that. In the Heidelberg Catechism, in the last section, section that talks about gratitude, it says, We've been, been delivered from our sins. Why do we still do good? Well, Christ has redeemed us, and we do good to show the Holy Spirit's working in us. That's why you're going to love your neighbor and keep doing it as a Christian. Because the Holy Spirit has been given to you, not just to be saved from sin, but free now to serve by loving. We show our thankfulness to God in our life of gratitude. You taught me that. And we knew none so that our neighbors may be one over in Christ. You taught me that. That's why I get excited about Christians being freed from sin and talking about that and to live a life that will point others because you care for others who are not yet Christians. And I can remember talking with my brother about what happened and that teenagers make wrong decisions just like the rest of us. But don't judge the love of God and the saving grace of Jesus by only and entirely looking at people who are imperfect. <coughs> Always turn your eyes upon Jesus and know that he loves you and he died for your sins. And that no matter how imperfect the church may be, the church is still here 
to do what you say that you want this congregation to do. And it's all because of Jesus, Jesus, Jesus dying for our sins and our living for him. And then I'll use an illustration of how that played out in the life of a 12-year-old, almost 13-year-old boy at Southwest Christian. I used this illustration before because it shows that teenagers also show the love of Jesus to others. And so I'm in Bible class with Don Angema, teacher from McBain, Michigan. And um, there are 20, 30 of us in class, three classes of seventh graders at Southwest Christian. My first year there, I know only a very few people from Franklin Street, and one of them said to me when I was baptized, Dougie, I didn't know you were a white boy because we lived with black people. And he said, I always thought you were a, a black boy. I never thought, done. I never thought I would be around so many Christians and so many white people. But here I am because of God's grace and calling. So there I am in Don Angelman's Bible class, seventh grade, Southwest Christian, not knowing many. And so it's Old Testament review. And the question is, from what tribe of Israel is the line of salvation? Or does Jesus come from? From which tribe of Israel? So 29 hands went up. Mine didn't go up. I don't know. And so Mr. Angel, he was such a nice guy. He wanted to include me. And I remember him looking at the class and then focusing on me and saying, what do you think, Doug? <laughs> and my head was down because I didn't want to be asked. But anyway, I looked up. I knew there were tribes, but I, don't, I didn't know the answer. You know the answer. Maybe all of you know the answer. So I said, the only one that I knew of, the son. Joseph, Joseph. It must be Joseph. I knew I had the wrong answer when 29 hands went up. And it's Judah. I mentioned that because after that class, the seventh graders did not consider me. No, they incorporated me. They accepted me. You, some of you, accepted me. You were part of Southwest. And I want to say thank you for accepting Someone who didn't know the right answer and yet showing the love of Jesus and including me. And I can remember not just using that in a sermon, but reminding others and my brother that the love of God still is active. Maybe not perfect yet in us, but it's still active. And we still reach out. We want others to be won over to Christ and to care for them. And not just time, but for eternity and self. So that's the sermon tonight. I don't even know. Oh. We are saved to serve. We are free to serve. Not to indulge the sinful flesh, but to show the love of Jesus to others. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the time that you've given to us tonight. 
to worship and praise you. I thank you for this congregation continuing to use them powerfully, not only to celebrate your, your grace, but also to share it with others. And all, Lord, as we soon leave this your house, may we put into practice all that we believe. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen.